Throughout scripture, you will find the word must used 132 times. And that little word is mentioned in 126 verses in scripture. Now this morning, I would like for us to consider this little word, must. This little word, particularly in the New Testament, comes from the Greek word die. And it means, it's uh, what well, is an impersonal verb that signifies that something is necessary, or one must, or one ought. It is imperative. Strong's Concordance points out that this is something that is binding. With these definitions in mind, I'd like for us to study this little word, this small but powerful word, in seven different uses. In John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. Now this passage harkens back to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And that reads, and they journeyed from Mount Hor to, or by the way of the Red Sea, to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And thou shalt come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he had beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So we see in verses 4 and 5 that the people began to be discouraged, and they spoke against God, they spoke against Moses. It wasn't just complaining, it was murmuring. They were complaining against God about how he was taking care of them, or really how he wasn't taking care of them, but we can read better, he was. In verse 6, we note that the fiery serpents were sent as punishment. In verse 7, we see that the people realized that they had sinned, and they were called to repentance. And Moses prayed for them. In verses 8 and 9, we see the remedy, the brass serpent. If you were bitten by it, and you looked at this serpent, that would be removed from you. You would not die. Now, if you didn't look at that serpent, what do you think would have happened? You would have died. Now, what happens if you were a farther way off from that serpent? Well, you'd have to make that little journey to go look at the serpent. Jesus, for us, applies Romans 15, verse 4 here. It's there for our learning. He gives us a reason of this passage back in Numbers 21. It's, again, for our learning. We know, for a proper application, that we all have sinned, Romans 3.23. And because of that sin, we all deserve death, Romans 6.23. Now, God, just in those days, supplied the remedy for the people of Israel, has supplied us a remedy for our sin. And that is for His Son to be lifted upon the cross and die for us, just as that serpent was raised up for the people. Jesus is our remedy today. John chapter 3 verse 15 says, Those that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If we are lost, there is no one to blame but ourselves. Just as the people of Israel, if they chose not to look at that serpent and were already bitten, they would have died. If we choose not to follow after Jesus, when this life is over, we inherit eternal death. Our second must, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men 
whereby we must be saved. It is imperative. We know that there is only one way to heaven. We've sang songs. There's a straight and narrow way. The, the way called straight. We find that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. He is the only way to God. Not Muhammad. He's not the answer. The Pope is not the answer. J. Smith, you know, Joseph Smith, he doesn't have the answer. Ellen G. White, you can go on with that list. They don't have the answer as far as how to get to God. They can tell you what man thinks is necessary, but only Jesus is the way to God. You might also keep in mind that even other people named Jesus or Jesus. Salvation is not in their name either. In powerlifting, we had a, a competitor. His name was Jesus Castro. And I thought it was pretty interesting. One of my teammates thought that was a, an interesting combination of names. It didn't go together. Well, that is kind of funny, at least especially to us high school boys. But Jesus Castro is not going to save me. It is Jesus the Christ, the very Son of God, who is the avenue to God. Again, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus is the author of salvation. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Second part of that verse reads, He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now what's an author? We all know that. Authors write, or at least have written in times past. They write books. They write articles. They write some type of manuscript. They write something. Well, Jesus wrote our salvation. And it's through obedience to his will. He is the very word of God. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. And coupled with John chapter 1 verse 14. Therefore it is his authority that we must seek out. Colossians 3 verse 17. Therefore obedience is key. Simply coming to the fact that Jesus is the only way is not going to save you. Obedience to his will. That is what is necessary. Again, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Unto all them that obey him. All of them that obey him. That leaves no one out. If you're obedient to him. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. We are able to obtain salvation in this life. Jesus secures that salvation while we're alive. John chapter 4, 15. Again, obedience to his will. And he secures it after this life is over. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 5. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. If you live your life a certain way. That way being the way Christ would have you to live. He's going to make it to where you cannot lose heaven. After this life is over. We should take great comfort in knowing that. <clears throat> Our third must. We find in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We find an impossibility here. It is impossible to please God without faith. We must have faith in order to please God. Now the Greek word here is pistis. It is a firm persuasion, a conviction based upon hearing. We've, we've had it stated prior that it's foundation upon credible witnesses, their testimony, evidence. Now we find the description of faith, or a description of it rather, in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 1 through 3. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now that word substance. It's an interesting little word there. It's not how we typically use it. Substance is 
you know, I want some substance with my meal. It's not meat and potatoes. It's not that type of thing. It's more substance. When you look at the older railroads and you look at the bridges, that undergirding structure that supports the track, that's the substance. Our salvation is built upon substance, our faith. Faith is the structure that supports salvation. Now, just as those elders obtained a good report, we too can obtain a good report through our faith. And in every dispensation, patriarchy, the law of Moses, and now the Christian age, God has supplied adequate evidence, abundant evidence that he is Jehovah God. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we talked a little bit about that in this morning's Bible class. At some point, all men everywhere knew God. They even obeyed God. God supplied enough evidence for those people to believe and trust God to follow after him. He has done the same for us. In verse 3 of Hebrews 11, um, <clears throat> chapter 1, he references the creation. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Physical creation has typically been called general revelation. That is physical evidence that there is a creator. Thankfully, we are able to call that creator our heavenly father through obedience to his will. There is overwhelming evidence to support a designer. Thus God. <clears throat> We see in various accounts throughout chapter 11 of Hebrews that there are, that the individuals mentioned there had great faith and they were rewarded for it. Two of, or one of which we'd like to note is Abraham, in particular offering his son Isaac. Now this passage originally was stated in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. You can read about that account where Abraham had, in his mind, already sacrificed Isaac. You read in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 how he was able to do that. He trusted God enough to raise him from the ashes. To resurrect his son because he knew after all that Isaac was the son of promise. Yet he was supposed to sacrifice him. We also note Jesus in the garden. Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 through 44. What a terrible thing being crucified is. None of us have to endure that. Jesus did for us. We can read about the things that he endured, all the pain he went through, all the, sh uh, the mocking and the shame he endured for us. But throughout his praying in the garden, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Do we have that same attitude? Our fourth must we see in Acts chapter 16, verse 30. The jailer there says, or says, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This man was trembling. He was afraid because of the events that just occurred in his presence. Again, we know he was presented with evidence. There was a great earthquake, and no doubt he had seen and heard the things of this gospel, the miracles that were performed. But either way, in that prison, <clears throat> verses 26, 25 and verse 26, there was an earthquake that occurred and all the doors were opened in that prison. And verse 30, we see the question being asked, what must I do to be saved? There's a book, I believe it's by Leroy Brownlow, that answers that question. And he breaks it down, what must I do to be saved? Each of those is an individual question. And he strings it all together in his book. Certainly a good book to read. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we see the answer. <clears throat> We're told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Well, is that all that's necessary? Is that all I must do to be saved? Well, certainly not. We know from other areas of scripture that belief only will not save you. James chapter 2 verse 24. Either way, this passage continues. 
in verse 32 of Acts chapter 16, he's instructed further. Not just the, the jailer, but his entire house. We see in verse 33 that he and his house were baptized. So part of that instruction was to talk about baptism. And then verse 34, all rejoiced. So now we know what must the jailer do to be saved. Not just the jailer, but for us today. What must we do to be saved? Well, we just read a pattern of it. Our fifth must comes from John chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus speaking says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now this confused Nicodemus because he thought Jesus was speaking about a physical birth. And that's not at all what Jesus meant. We, sang, we just sang a song a few moments ago, a new creature. It's a really pretty song. This is what Jesus was referencing. You must be born again. This new birth puts to death our old life of sin. Romans chapter 1 verses 1, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 6. This birth in John chapter 3 verse 5 is a water in the spirit. Speaking of, the, uh, of God's word. And once we're baptized, we undergo this new birth. We arise a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. As well as Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. Jesus said that this new birth is the only way to see the kingdom. It is the only way to enter the kingdom. John chapter 3 verse 3 as well as verse 5. It is imperative that we undergo this new birth. We cannot obtain salvation without it. This new birth, this one baptism, is the one that you can read about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. It is a regeneration in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It is also how we are reconciled to our Creator, God the Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, as well as Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Our sins separate us from God. But it is the act of baptism that allows us to contact the very blood of Jesus, our Savior, that washes our sins away. Thus we are reconciled to our Creator. Our sixth must. We find in John chapter 4 verse 24. It says, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now if you've grown up hearing that all your life. That might not be as big of a deal to you. But it was certainly a big enough deal for Jesus to tell this to the woman at the well. You know, you look out, consider people who actually get out of their house on Sunday mornings to gather for some type of assembly. And I don't mean on the lake with buddies, fishing or doing whatever they do, or going to any other gathering that you can think of. Take the ark up north in Conroe. You think they're worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Well, there's, there's will worship. What I want to do, that's what God's going to accept. You think that's what Jesus was talking about when he spoke to this woman at the well? There's also vain worship. It's empty. It's worthless. It's pointless. There's a whole host of people worshiping in those two kinds of ways. Certainly those are not acceptable to God. And, of course, you have true worship, which is what Jesus paints in John chapter 4, verse 24. We note from this conversation that some probably don't even realize what or who they are worshiping. Jesus plainly said, ye worship, ye know not what. Talking to the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4, verse 22. You don't know what you're worshiping. He said, salvation is of the Jews. We know who we worship. We worship Yahweh, Jehovah God. Some, their belly is their God, their senses, their fleshly appetites. Philippians chapter 3 verse 19. Others, covetousness, idolatry, the almighty dollar. That leads so many people straight to hell today. Colossians 3 verse 5. Matthew chapter 16 verses 25 and 6. Mark chapter 8, verses 35 through 38, and 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 
If you gain the entire world and lose your soul, you just lost in life. As is well stated in Bible class, you failed the test of life. You flunked. Now that might come as a, a shock to people nowadays, especially with the education system, because we can't fail anybody anymore. We just pass them along, here's a number, and you kind of squeak by and you go on to the next grade. There's no child left behind. There's no principle like that with God. You have this life, and that's it, to prove to him that you love him and are willing to obey him in all things. And sadly, many folks are driven by the almighty dollar. As Jesus stated, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Which means we must have the right attitude and we must have the right authority. Dare I say a pattern. That might cause some people to have a heart attack nowadays because they don't like patterns. It's interesting because that in and of itself is a pattern to follow. Either way, we have a pattern to follow for worship. Worship is outlined in scripture for the New Testament Christian. They are to engage in singing on the first day of the week, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. They are to pray, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They are to engage in contribution, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. They are to have a Bible study, similar to what we're having now, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And they are also to partake of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 29. Now, on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, if you do not participate in those five acts of worship, you have not worshipped God in spirit and in truth. Now, you can participate, you can perform those acts, at least four of them, on other days. We're only authorized to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Every first day of the week. But I can sing every other day in in fact, we have a, a middle-of-the-week study, Bible study, that we gather with the intent to worship God. We sing, we have Bible study, and we pray. That's worship to God. It's not first uh, day of the week worship, but it's still worship. We're still engaging in three acts of God-authorized worship. That seems to be a concept that some people don't understand. That is worship. But again, it's not first day of the week worship. There is a difference. Our seventh must. We find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Everyone is going to give an account of the things that they've done in this life. The whole of man, our very duty, the essence of our reason of being here, we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. We are to, to find out God, to fear Him, and to do His commandments. It's that simple. But that concept is lost on most of the world. We also know that it is the individual that gives an account to God for his or her life. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 and Romans chapter 14 verse 12. I am so very thankful that I do not have to answer for the things my father has done. I am fairly certain a lot of us can say the same thing. I am thankful that I don't have to answer for anybody else. I have a big enough responsibility answering for myself. And so do you. Each and every one of us. After physical death, after our life in this, or after our life is over, comes the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. There will be a final day. When this whole world is called to an end, everything will be burned up. Judgment day begins. We find in John chapter 12, verses 48 through 50, that the standard of judgment will be the very words of Christ. So we ask, you need to bear in mind, 
with respect to that standard, what will you hear? There's two possible answers. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21 and 23, well done. I want to hear well done. Or you could hear depart. I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23. Now that should scare everyone to our core. Depart from me. I never knew you. Your creator saying, I didn't know you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The idea of, of judgment to some, I know in at least Egyptian mythology, and I'm fairly certain that it's kind of taken root in many others, is the heart of the individual that has died is weighed against a feather. If your heart is heavier than that feather, you go to what they call torment. I forget exactly what they call it, but it's not heaven. It's punishment. But if the feather is heavier, then you go on to your reward. Well, most folks look at sin that way. If I do enough good to outweigh the bad, then I'm golden. You won't find that supported in Scripture. One sin will cause you to be out of heaven. One sin, and you're out of step with the Lord's army. It doesn't take two. It doesn't take three. It doesn't take any more than that. It's one solitary sin. And that will separate you from your father. But as we've studied earlier, obedience to the will of Christ can remove those sins. And they will restore you to a proper relationship between you and your creator. So if we, as we have discussed these seven musts, it's a very little word, but it's a very powerful word. These things are imperative. It's not an option. It's not a multiple choice you get to pick from other things. No. What do we have above us over here? Colossians 3.17. We need authority for the things that we do. We've been given that authority through the word of Christ. We're all subject to that authority. Are you obeying it? Do you have sin in your life today? Are you prepared to answer for the things that you've done in this life? If you're not, why not? Because the end is coming. We joke about that frequently. Something bad happens, there's kind of a silly situation, the end is near. We don't know how near the end is. It could be next few seconds. We might all be granted that we go home this afternoon. We don't know. Are you ready to give an answer for your life at this particular moment? If you're not, why not? It could be that you're not a Christian. You're not a child of God. Do what it takes to become one. We've studied those things and how to do so. Or if you are a child of God, you know, sometimes we, we stumble. We allow sin back into our lives. We allow this world to take higher importance than the things of God. If that is indeed the case with you, whether you need to put on Christ in baptism or remove sin through... The second law of pardon, 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 9. Please take this time as we together stand and sing.